L'Oreal is synonymous with beauty. The world's biggest cosmetics company has been fronted by some of the planet's most famous faces, including Penelope Cruz, Jennifer Aniston, and Beyonce. It caters to people in more than 150 countries, with brands including household names like Lancôme, Maybelline, and Garnier. And behind it all is Jean-Paul Agon, his mission to bring beauty to everyone. Right after graduating with a business degree, he joined L'Oréal at the age of 22, and he's been there ever since. He climbed the ranks from positions in sales and marketing to president of L'Oréal USA in 2001. He would be named chief executive of the whole company just five years later. Under his tenure, L'Oréal has nearly doubled its global revenue and expanded its footprint in Asia. We spoke to Jean-Paul Agon on leaders back in 2017, but how has being a leader changed since then and what lessons has he learned? Jean-Paul Agon, the chief executive of L'Oréal, joins us on Leaders with L'Aqua. Jean-Paul Agon of L'Oréal, thank you so much for joining us on Leaders with L'Aqua. You look at the numbers and you know the number of mascaras that you sell a week or a year is absolutely astonishing. Did uh -huh. you ever think that L'Oréal would become so big? Um, I don't know. You know, I joined L'Oréal 42 years ago. And it's true, you're right. It's a good question because at, the, at that time it was much smaller. You know, now we sell uh, 7 billion products a year. Uh, we have more than uh, 1.2.3 uh, billion consumers. I, I, I don't remember exactly where we were 40 years ago, but probably a, a much smaller company. Uh, but still, we have room to grow. You know, we have only 13% market share in the world. So uh, the best is yet to come. I mean, as you said, you've been in charge for, for 40 years. How, how have you changed as a leader? No, I've been in charge for 40, 14 years, but I've been but at you've been at the company. For yeah, 40, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I think we changed many things. You know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the, all the changes that we made at L'Oreal. You know, we, we, even the revolution that we made, uh, we made the digital revolution. L'Oreal is now clearly... Uh, ahead of the pack in terms of digital and e-commerce. And because we were the first to take the, the, the move, uh, we are ahead in terms of uh, sustainability. We are ahead in terms of ethics. Uh, so I think that on, on the most important transformation of the world, uh, we were able also to transform the company uh, to make sure that we are always, uh, always leader in the, in the field. What's the hardest thing about your job? When you talk about the digital revolution, I mean, that must be online sales, but also advertising spending. Yeah, absolutely. Because I guess you spend less with magazines and more with influencers. Oh, yes. Now we spend more than 60% of our media on, on digital. So it has been a real big change in the, in the past uh, already five to 10 years. So everything is changing. You know, what, what's fascinating in the, in the world of today is that you, you cannot just rest uh, one minute or one day. You know, it's a, it's a permanent evolution. And if you want, like us, to be ahead uh, in the curve, you have always to try to anticipate what's going to happen and be the first uh, to take new initiative, new direction. And uh, that's the most fascinating part. So what's the trend or direction that you're looking at now? What's the next big thing? But, you know, there are several, but one, one thing that is very important for me is that I, I believe that uh, beauty is going to become very much tech, you know, like uh, medicine is becoming med tech or finance is becoming fintech. And I'll, uh, so I, I want L'Oréal to be the champion of the beauty tech. I think that beauty will be beauty tech tomorrow, and I want L'Oréal to be the, the pioneer, the champion, and the leader of the beauty tech. And it's very exciting, too. So give, give me a, a bit of an idea of exactly what this will entail. I know you, you have a laboratory where you make, you know, skin. It's, is it the kind of thing where, you know, you go through a computer and they tell you, look, you've aged prematurely and so you have to get this cream or is it something even more sophisticated? More sophisticated. It's more holistic and more sophisticated. You know, it's a, in a way, it's the alliance of a, a very top performing uh, digital uh, ecosystem and uh, transforming your company into an intelligent company where uh, data uh, circulates completely across the company, where artificial intelligence is used in every department and where in fact everything is completely connected. And so this, this combination of uh, extern external relationship through digital and internal 
uh, transformation and use of data, uh, I think it's really the future. But so how will the relationship with the customer change? Is it, you know, will beauty become much more about healthcare as well or health? I don't know. It, it's no, I don't know if it's going to change. The, the, the relationship, the easiness of the relationship will change. And, and you know, eventually, uh, this, uh, this system, this beauty tech system, could also lead to a kind of individual relationship with every consumer that we have. Uh, you know, it's uh, probably uh, in the next uh, five years, uh, we will have a direct connection with the one, uh, each of the 1.2 billion consumers that we have on the planet. And so that, that's going to be very interesting. How much is social media changing? So how much do you now prefer TikTok, for example, to an Instagram? Well, you know, it changes every day. So, <laughs> so it's a, you have always to, uh, to adapt. And also at L'Oreal, you know, we, we, we let our brands uh, do, this, uh, do these initiatives, uh, adapt to the, the different uh, social media. Some of our brands are more are, uh, related to Facebook. Some others are, are more related to uh, TikTok, uh, but for example, on TikTok, uh, it's true that it's uh, it's still very recent, and uh, and the collaboration that we have with them is still very small. Uh, it's just a few million dollars. But uh, but for example, they were very instrumental in the huge success of our brand Cerave. Uh, Cerave is a new uh, health uh, skincare brand, and that is uh, super successful in the U.S. And uh, TikTok was part of that. And now it's uh, the same for the other brand, La Roche-Posay. So we, we, we try to manage uh, things uh, across brands and uh, with different partners as well. What has surprised you the most uh, within your time as chief executive of L'Oréal? The, the speed of change. Uh, the speed of change uh, has really accelerated. And uh, I think that the, the, the world uh, is... Uh, the speed of change of the world is really uh, is really amazing, and uh, you know, for example, the, the digital uh, tsunami that happened. You know, we, in a way, we anticipated it, but uh, I didn't even think that it would come so quickly. The rise of e-commerce, as we discussed, is, is very quick. Uh, the transformation of China is something amazing. So the the, the speed of change now uh, is really something that uh, fascinates me. Coming up, beauty in the age of coronavirus. We talk how the industry has been managing through the pandemic. What we saw right after the reopening of uh, Salon is that there was a rush to go to the hairdressers and, uh, and that uh, everybody was uh, very happy to go back. may be in the eye of the beholder, but these days, the eye beholds through Zoom. The COVID pandemic has shut down hospitality, retail, workplaces, and salons, forcing the beauty industry to embrace do it at home like never before. People have been forced to become their own hairstylists, and this season's hottest new lipstick will get covered up by a mask. So, how is all this chaos affecting the beauty industry? L'Oréal is the biggest beauty company in the world, and the chief executive, Jean-Paul Agon, has had to get creative. The company has rolled out digital color matching and ramped up its online presence to keep consumers shopping. The company's e-commerce platform has almost doubled during the pandemic, and its share price ended 2020 higher. You don't think people will buy less lipstick because, frankly, we're wearing a mask, we don't go out as much. So actually, maybe some of our tastes can change over time. No, I don't think so. On the contrary, I think that uh, there is a frustration today uh, by women not being able to, to use cosmetic or, or makeup, exactly like there was a, a big frustration during uh, the period when you couldn't go to hairdressers. And uh, what we saw right after the reopening of uh, Salon is that there was a rush to go to the hairdressers and, uh, and that uh, everybody was uh, very happy to go back. So I think the, the same will happen with, uh, with makeup even with lipstick. And I think that uh, when the COVID will be gone, uh, this will be the, the lipstick failure. I mean, uh, the great, a great time for lipstick and makeup. Do we shop differently? So are, are you going to have more of a push of online and how much has that increased compared oh, yeah. to pre-pandemic levels? Yeah, that's, that's, that's for sure. I mean, the, the, the real fundamental change of the, of the market is in the way uh, to shop. Uh, 
before uh, before the pandemic, uh, e-commerce was, for example, for us already uh, growing fast, plus 50 percent, but it was at uh, 15, 20 percent. It grew uh, very quickly during the, the the crisis, and now we are at 30 percent. So the, there there has been a complete change of behavior during the crisis, and I think that this this change will uh, will stay. How do you adapt? So if I'm looking for a color, either a foundation or lipstick or something else, it's so much harder to actually choose it on the internet. No, not at all. You know, uh, especially thanks to uh, all the, the technology that we have, because uh, thanks to the Modiface acquisition that we made uh, two or three years ago, if you shop uh, on, uh, on e-commerce, on internet, uh, you can simulate on yourself uh, with a virtual reality uh, system simulate the, the, the color that you, it will have on your lips or uh, the color on your eyes and you can try all colors so in fact the thanks to technology today uh, trying products uh, on internet is uh, as uh, good as uh, trying in stores um jean paul how different will the beauty market be though be in two three years so let's say that you know the pandemic has a minimal effect which you seem to be saying what will be different in two three years We'll see, you know, it's too early to tell because we will see uh, at the end of the crisis if behaviors would change, but, but I would bet that they won't change fundamentally. You know, uh, I have been through many crises and every time people were saying after it would be completely different uh, and, and finally it was not. So uh, I think that uh, be beside what we discussed before, the, the fact that people will shop much more on e-commerce, I think in terms of categories, in terms of... Uh, appetite for beauty in terms of consumption, uh, it, it, will, it will be very different. Or at least the, the differences will be more or less the differences that, that would have happened anyway. You know, more appetite for uh, natural products, for clean beauty, for all, for natural ingredients. And, but that existed already before. So the, the crisis is more an accelerator of trends than a disruptor of trends. How much of your sales are you expecting to actually do online in three, four years from now? You know, we, we're going to be uh, very soon at uh, 30%. Uh, um, maybe one day, you know, in the, the next, before the next 10 years, uh, it's going to be 50%. It's possible. That's already what we are doing in China. You know, in China, we started from almost scratch uh, five years ago. It's from zero and uh, we'll be at uh, 50% this year. And, and it's, it's phenomenal for a brand like Maybelline, you know, the number one uh, makeup ma brand in the world. Uh, we do 70% of our sales of makeup in China on, uh, on e-commerce. So it, it's, it's a real complete transformation. But do, do Chinese consumers buy beauty products differently to Europe? I know there's you know, a number of questions also about testing on animals and things like that. But fundamentally, is China a template of what you want to replicate around the world? Or is it just also a different, bigger market? No, it's not a template that we want to replicate. It's just a head. <laughs> it's just a head in the game. Because China today is probably the most advanced country in the world in terms of digitalization, e-commerce, habits, etc., and consumption in China uh, is very much ahead of what we see everywhere else in the world because of the young Chinese, they adapt very quickly to the to the change of technology. So it's it's fun when you do when you discuss with young Chinese consumers, young, young ladies, uh, and you discuss with them where, where do you shop your products? They they say online, of course. And if you tell them, uh, do you know that you could also buy them in the store? They say, ah, I didn't know. Uh, some of them, at least. So it's it's a real change of uh, of mindset that is happening to, uh, today in China. Um, Jean Paul, if we look at the various segments of beauty products that you have, and also hair products, what will accelerate the most in the next three to four years? Is it skincare? Is it something that you want to be to be you know a real leader on? Yeah, skin skincare is definitely uh, booming uh, because skincare, uh, you know. Skincare is a very important category all over the world, very important in Asia. It has always been very important. It was not that important, for example, in North America. And now it's growing very fast. It's growing also in Western Europe, everywhere. So skincare, and also with this all, all this new, uh, you know, concern about health. Uh, it's also about the health of your skin. So the, 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 the Good skincare, quality skincare is super important, and this is growing very fast. It's our number one 
category now at L'Oreal. Uh, we are the number one uh, manufacturer of skincare, and I expect that uh, that will continue to grow. Um, what does it mean for possible M and A acquisition? Is there anything that you'd be looking to buy because valuations <laughs> are quite cheap because of the pandemic? <laughs> Nothing is cheap because of the pandemic. Cheaper. <laughs> no, it's not even cheaper, but it's not the it's not the issue. The issue is to find something which is strategic and interesting for the future. You know, we, we did an acquisition during the the crisis. You know, we it was not very uh, uh, very visible, but we we bought an, uh, an American skincare brand called Thayer's, a uh, very nice brand in America. We bought it in uh, in May, so in the middle of the lockdowns, and uh, so we keep doing our our M and A activity. And, uh, and it's, for example, this brand is going to be a very interesting brand for the future. So we are always looking for new opportunities. Up next, green beauty. We talk L'Oréal's sustainability push and why it matters to shoppers. Consumers want to, uh, to make sure that the, the product they are buying comes from, the, from a very serious and responsible company. That, that's a very important uh, element for, for them. So that, that's why we are communicating more and more. It's not at all greenwashing. Whatever shade of lipstick is in the season, one thing's for sure, it'll be green. Sustainability was one of the key buzzwords of 2020, and L'Oréal chief executive Jean-Paul Agon promises his company's commitment to the environment is real. He says we are in a climate emergency and have one decade to act. L'Oréal says it will help its 1.5 billion consumers make sustainable choices and limit the impact of its cosmetics products. But can makeup and packaging ever truly be green if so much of it may end up in landfills? Jean-Paul Lagon pledges a more beautiful future for all. In the past, when we used to speak about sustainability, you always told me that this was a cause that was important to you, but you couldn't translate it or you couldn't really see it in consumer sales. Has that changed? Yeah, slowly, slowly. You know, the, the, the fact is that we are doing the change anyway. You know, we, we announced recently our, our new plan, Loyal for the Future, which is a very important and ambitious plan for the next 10 years. And, uh, and so we are very committed. And as you know, we were uh, the company the most recognized by the CDP with uh, four years in a row in a, a AAA on, on all aspects of sustainability. So we, we keep pushing for it. And it's true that now we are more and more communicating it on our brands. Each of our brands is also communicating with its consumers about what they do and what the group does in terms of sustainability. It becomes more and more an important factor for consumers too. So what's important for the consumer? Is it the recycling? Is it the, the, where you go and get the products? Is it the supply chain? Is it animal testing? It's a bit everything. You know, animal testing uh, is, is over now. It has been over for many years. But now it's uh, it's about you're right. It's about uh, it's about plastic. It's about uh, the quality of the ingredients. Is how we so we solve them. But it's also also the, the how the, the company behaves. You know, consumers want to uh, to make sure that the the product they are buying comes from a, from a very serious and responsible company. That that's a very important uh, element for for them. So that that's why we are communicating more and more. It's not at all greenwashing or it, it has not a commercial intention, but it's more a question to inform the consumers uh, really well. And this translates into sales? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. For the moment, it, it's not, uh, we, we don't do it for that. We, we do it in, in an uh, effort of transparency, of communication. But, but ultimately, I think that, uh, you know, sustainability of, uh, of the behavior of the company will translate in sustainability of good sales. How much more work, Jean-Paul Le Gond, do you need to do on diversity and inclusion to, to be on a place where, where you're happy where L'Oréal is? But, you know, we, we are pretty good already. You know, we were recognized as one of the top 10 companies in terms of uh, diversity and inclusion worldwide we, recently, and we got uh, a recognition for that. We, we started uh, 
on diversity many years ago. I remember that when I was in the States in, uh, in 2004, I created the first uh, chief diversity officer. It has always been the top uh, priority on, uh, on our ethics at the company. Uh, we did an intense, uh, 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 how do you say, training for all our managers, 20,000 people uh, already uh, 15 years ago. So this is super important. It's true that it's a, it has to be a permanent effort because you, you have permanently to, uh, to repeat it and, and make sure that it's a, it's a priority for the company, but it's very much at the top of our, of our priorities. But I guess, I mean, you and need to work on, on two fronts, right? So part of is what you're saying, if that culture is indeed at L'Oréal, just to keep it going amongst your staff to make sure that there's, you know, gender and diversity inclusion and everything like that. But also I get what the beauty industry portrays in, in campaigns Absolutely. and things like that. Absolutely. But, but that, I think, has, has been really taken in charge by, the, by our brands. You know, if you see our, our different brands, uh, they are really uh, now mirroring the society and, uh, and the, the, the beauty they express is, is a real, complete, diverse and inclusive beauty. So it's, uh, you're right, it's a very important point, but, but this has been really taken in charge by the, by the brands. Do you think 2020 was a turning point? Because we talk a, a lot more about diversity and race. I think in general it was a turning point, but honestly, uh, not really for us, uh, because uh, it has been a, an effort and push that we, we, we started uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, but it has been uh, a reminder that uh, we have to push always stronger. I think it was, a, in a way, it was a, a positive, uh, positive reminder that uh, you never do enough. So uh, I think it's good. Yeah, I mean, L'Oréal is so big, and you have so many, you know, brands and all over the world. How difficult is it to get a, a very firm handle on the supply chain, a very firm handle on, uh, you know, diversity and inclusion efforts? Oh, no, it's very simple. You know, it's very simple because even if, uh, if we have many brands, uh, you know, the backstage uh, is, the, is common. You know, it's the same factory, it's, it's the same uh, team, it's the operation team, the sourcing team. We have one sourcing team for, for all brands of the company. So they, when they have clear instruction and clear directions, uh, they apply them very strictly for any brand that, uh, that is part of the portfolio. It can be a very big brand or a small one. So that's why also the, the measures that we are taking are always uh, very strictly applied. I mean, there is no room for, uh, for doing differently. <laughs> Um, how much are, are you spending actually on research to make sure that some of your packaging and is, is sustainable, is recyclable? Oh, we do a lot. We do a lot and, and we try our, our best. And for example, also we are doing partnerships with, uh, with companies because, of course, we are, we are more beauty manufacturers. We are not a, a plastic manufacturer. So for us, packaging are, 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 are things that we buy. So, but we, we help uh, our suppliers. Uh, to develop new technologies. For example, we developed uh, recently, we helped recently a, a small uh, French company based in, uh, in Lyon called Carbios, who invented a completely revolutionary uh, way to dissolve plastic, enzymatic system mm -hmm. that, that makes plastic disappear so that you can completely recycle it. So that's, that's the way to participate you know, in the ecosystem. To the to the uh, to the change of uh, of packaging uh, in general. Monsieur Agon, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Francine.